This seminar is for educational purposes only. It is not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Consult with your medical provider for medical advice or treatment. Although the presenters try to keep the information in this seminar as accurate and timely as possible, the speakers and Mather Hospital assume no duty to ensure the seminar is error-free. The speakers and Mather Hospital are not responsible or liable for any claim, loss, or damage resulting from you viewing this seminar. This Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for our Healthy You webinar series. Today's topic is maybe it's your thyroid. At any time during the presentation, please feel free to enter any questions you may have using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will answer as many questions as we can within the time allotted once the presentation concludes. Your questions will remain anonymous. Today's presenter is Dr. Georgia Kalina. Dr. Kalina grew up in Miller Place, New York and completed medical school at Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia. She completed her internal medicine residency and endocrinology fellowship at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. She joined Harborview in 2018 and lives nearby with her husband and four sons. Dr. Kalina. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. So we'll be talking a lot about the thyroid, which many people tend to have questions about. Hopefully I'll answer all of your questions in the course of the lecture. Otherwise, we'll have a question and answer session at the end. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so where is your thyroid? Your thyroid is located in your neck and it's a butterfly-shaped gland that actually wraps around your windpipe or your trachea. So it's lower down in the neck than many people think. And as we age, it can actually become what we call substernal or behind the bones on the upper chest. So it's actually quite low down. Some people come to me feeling pain up below their chin area. That's unlikely to be related to the thyroid, although in certain thyroid conditions, the glands can be quite enlarged and can come up much higher. But for the most part, when I'm feeling for the thyroid, I'm feeling in the lower neck. Now this diagram shows, I don't know if you can see my pointer here. Um, but this, this diagram um, in the neck, uh, the large diagram in the center shows the thyroid and it's wrapped around the trachea, which is the windpipe. Um, on the right upper corner of the screen, there's a posterior picture of the thyroid, meaning it's the thyroid turned around. You're looking at it from the back and those small, four small golden colored glands or P-shaped glands there are called parathyroid glands. Those glands are not related to the thyroid, but they sit next to the thyroid. So that's why they're called parathyroid glands. They are actually involved in calcium metabolism. Sometimes I take care of people with parathyroid problems. And in those circumstances, it's not related to the thyroid at all. Those are different. Um, but because they sit right next to the thyroid, they have a similar name and that can get confusing. Okay. All right. Next slide, please. So if you want to look at your own neck and see if you can feel your thyroid, which can be very difficult to do, even myself, who I I feel thyroids all day long on people, and there are some people where you just can't feel the thyroid, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes there's a lot of tissue, sometimes there's big muscles in the neck that block your ability to feel the thyroid, but if you want to try to feel your thyroid, you can try standing in front of a mirror, you stretch your neck back and swallow, you can try swallowing water, um, and look for an enlargement that will kind of rise up, like bob upwards while you swallow. Um, and that's where the thyroid would be located. Um, you can feel the area, see if you feel a bump, you're gonna wanna feel in between the muscles of the neck because the muscles are gonna block your ability to feel the thyroid. Um, and then if you feel like you feel anything there or you're just not sure, check in with your doctor about it. Okay, next slide. So what does your thyroid do? The short answer is everything. Thyroid hormone is important for pretty much every organ in the body. Um, the thyroid produces, among other things, uh, thyroxine, which is T4, and thyronine, which is T3. 
mostly T4, and then your body converts a lot of the T4 to T3 as well. Um, but these hormones regulate your metabolism so that the cells can function properly. And pretty much every organ uses that thyroid hormone. It's kind of like the gas in your car. It's important for everything. Okay, next slide. So when we look at some of the effects of the thyroid on the body, that can help us determine side effects of low thyroid or too much thyroid. So what what, how are organs affected by the thyroid hormone? So for example, the liver, you can end up with high cholesterol because of the way the thyroid is, affects the liver. In the intestines, if you don't have enough thyroid hormone, it can cause constipation. Um, it can affect the uterus. You can have decreased fertility. You can have problems with menstruation. Um, it can cause brain fog. It can cause difficulty with concentration. In your heart, if you have too much thyroid hormone, your heart can beat too fast. If you have too little thyroid hormone, your heart can beat too slow. It, it can affect your kidneys. It can affect fluid retention. So every part of your body can be affected by the thyroid. And that's what makes it so hard to find figure out what's causing your symptoms, because a lot of times the symptoms are very vague. It can affect all parts of your body and you might not even realize that you have a thyroid problem because the symptoms are leg swelling, for example, and you wouldn't necessarily think that that could be related to the thyroid. So it's just some things to think about. Okay, next slide. So this is a little bit of a busy slide, but um, I'll try and explain the diagram. Um, so there's a picture of the brain in the upper left-hand corner. Um, right below your brain sits a tiny little gland called the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland is the master gland of your body. It can sense all the hormones floating around in your bloodstream and it's very, 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 very smart. The pituitary gland makes a hormone called TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone. And you can see that circled with the red circle there. Um, Thyroid stimulating hormone tells your thyroid to make more hormone. So if the pituitary gland senses that there's not enough T4 floating around in your body, it will produce more TSH. So the levels are actually opposite. If the TSH is high, that means the body is sensing that there's not enough thyroid hormone. If the TSH is low, that means the body is sensing there's too much thyroid hormone. And so the pituitary gland is shutting off production of TSH. So it's telling the thyroid to stop making so much hormone. So again, the TSH will stimulate the thyroid to make hormone. And then the thyroid will make T4 and a little bit of T3 as well. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. So this is another diagram showing this uh, concept just because I think it's important. The pituitary gland is that circle and then the thyroid gland is that butterfly shaped picture. Um, so again, the pituitary makes TSH. It tells the thyroid to make hormone and the thyroid there in turn makes T4 and feeds back on the pituitary. So the pituitary feel, notices there's a lot of T4 and will decrease the production of TSH. So as doctors, when we're looking into the lab results, we can determine if there's a problem with your pituitary gland based on what we see or your thyroid gland based on what, what we see in the labs. So normally we would expect the TSH to be normal and the T4 to be normal in the blood. So what, what are we looking for in different conditions? Well, for hyperthyroidism, we would see that TSH would be low. And remember, hyperthyroidism is too much thyroid hormone. Hyper means too much. So you would see the TSH would be low and the T4 level would be high. So if the TSH is low, it's the opposite. It's too much thyroid hormone. In hypothyroidism or not enough thyroid hormone, you're going to see a high TSH and a low T4. There's something else that's much more rare. It's called secondary hypothyroidism. Um, it gets a little complicated, but that's basically where there's a problem with the pituitary. And again, that's quite rare. It's usually in somebody who has a history of a brain tumor or head trauma or certain type of chemotherapies can do this. Um, but that causes a problem with the pituitary. So in that circumstance, you'll see a low TSH and a low T4. 
Okay, next slide. Okay, great. So how common are thyroid disorders? The answer is extremely common, very, very thyroid. I mean, very, very common. Um, so over 20 million Americans have a thyroid disorder, more than half are undiagnosed. Um, that's why it's important to have checkups with your doctor, let them know your symptoms, and they can always check your thyroid level to make sure that it's okay. Um, it might even be more common than diabetes or heart disease. And up more than 12% of the population may develop a thyroid condition in their lifetime. Um, women are more likely than men to have thyroid conditions. One woman in eight may develop a thyroid disorder. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so who should be screened for thyroid conditions? So um, females are more likely than men. So especially women, if you're over the age of 35, you should consider having a thyroid level get checked, especially if you have a family history. So family history is very important. It tends to run in families. It's not a guarantee. I have families whose entire, I have patients whose entire family has a thyroid condition, but their thyroid works just fine, but it's still a good idea to keep an eye on it. Um, there are certain prescription medications such as lithium or amiodarone that can affect the thyroid. It is extremely important to have your thyroid monitored if you are taking those medications. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, in more detail later. If you've had radiation therapy to the head or neck, that might be external beam radiation for a different type of cancer, something like that you should also have your thyroid levels checked. And if you lived anywhere close to nuclear fallout or any exposure to radiation, you should also have your thyroid checked. Okay, next slide, please. So um, when it comes to disorders of hormone production in the thyroid, there are two things we're usually looking for, either hyperthyroidism, which again is too much hormone, or hypothyroidism, which again is too little hormone. Okay, next slide, please. So hypothyroidism is very, very common. Um, it's a disorder in which the thyroid doesn't make enough hormone. Um, it can be associated with problems with your heart, like coronary artery disease and congestive heart failure. So that's why we don't wanna miss this. Okay, next slide. In terms of symptoms of hypothyroidism, I'm sure I could make this list even longer. You can see it can cause many, many different things. Um, so for example, it can make us feel tired. It can cause brain fog. It can cause depression, difficulty with concentration, hair problems, dry skin, nail issues, infertility, constipation, the list goes on and on. Um, if, if the levels are quite severely low, you can actually get like a froggy voice, a deepening of the voice or a hoarseness. Um, and some people can get these puffy eyes. Those are usually in, in the more severe range of the spectrum. Um, for the most part, the symptoms can be mild. You might just notice you're cold all the time or um, your periods are a little irregular and that could be a sign of a thyroid condition. Now, one problem is that many other things can cause these symptoms as well. So many of us, especially with the pandemic and stress and so forth, have fatigue or depression or weight gain. So it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be the thyroid, but if you're struggling with some of those things, it's always good to get the lab checked. Okay, next slide. So some causes of hypothyroidism. The most common cause of hypothyroidism is something called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And what that means is that your body, for whatever reason, has created little antibodies that are floating around and can actually attack the thyroid gland. The thyroid then stops working properly as it gets attacked over time. Um, it's extremely common. Up to 10% of the population actually have these antibodies. And if you do have the antibodies, you have a 3% risk per year of developing hypothyroidism. So some people have these antibodies and their thyroid is working just fine. And that's great. Um, but I do recommend in patients who have these antibodies that they have their thyroid levels monitored a few times a year, just in case they do develop hypothyroidism. Um, radiation exposure we talked about. Sometimes you can have radioactive iodine treatment for other types of thyroid conditions, which I'll talk about 
a little later. Um, and that causes hypothyroidism once you are treated with that medication. Some people have surgical removal of their thyroid, in which case they are then they have to take medication for the rest of their lives to replace the hormone. Um, some people are on antithyroid medication for too much thyroid hormone, um, and then sometimes the levels can go too low. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier, you can have a pituitary gland problem or a tumor on your pituitary gland that causes a thyroid um, a hypothyroidism. There are some more rare conditions that are infiltrative diseases, such as hemochromatosis or sarcoidosis, and those can involve the thyroid. Um, so individuals with those conditions should also make sure they're getting their thyroid levels checked periodically. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there are certain drugs that can absolutely affect the thyroid. So um, lithium is a big one. If you're on lithium, you should have your thyroid levels evaluated once in a while. Same thing with amiodarone. Amiodarone is used for atrial fibrillation or heart arrhythmias. Um, so that is a medication that should have your thyroid, you should have your thyroid levels checked while you're on it. Um, and then there are certain, so for example, CAT scan contrast can actually activate your thyroid, it has a lot of iodine in it and can cause abnormalities with the thyroid levels. Um, and, and there are a few other things as well. And then some people are actually born without a thyroid. We do screen newborn babies for this because it's something that needs to be treated right away. Very interesting. Okay, next slide, please. So those who are at risk at, for hypothyroidism, we kind of discussed already. If you're a woman, if you are at advanced age, if you have a history of a thyroiditis, some sort of thyroiditis, like a postpartum thyroid problem, you might end up with hypothyroidism. If you have a big goiter, you should have that evaluated. The goiter is an enlargement of your thyroid. Um, if you had external radiation, or if you had other, if you have other autoimmune conditions, you should also just have your thyroid levels checked because you are at increased risk. For example, type one diabetes, all of my patients with type one diabetes when I first meet them and then periodically, I'll just keep an eye on their thyroid levels because it's very common for those two things to go hand in hand. Um, and then again, if you have a family history of thyroid disease or individuals with Down syndrome can also be at increased risk. Okay, next slide, please. So how do we diagnose hypothyroidism? Um, pretty much blood test. So the TSH levels are extremely accurate in most cases, unless you have a pituitary disorder. And usually we can determine that from your history. Um, so the TSH is, um, is pretty accurate, as I mentioned. There are certain hormone tests that aren't very accurate in the blood. For example, T3 levels are not very accurate in the blood. I usually use that to evaluate more for hyperthyroidism, but the TSH is extremely accurate. Um, and the TSH is very sensitive. The, th the pituitary is very smart. That is the first lab to become even a little bit abnormal if your thyroid levels are off. So it's usually, although someone may have symptoms that kind of fit the bill with, uh, for a thyroid disorder, um, if the TSH and T4 levels are normal in the blood, it's unlikely that you have a, a thyroid condition. So what if the TSH is found to be 10 and your T4 levels are a little bit low? What do we do? Um, so the treatment typically is something called levothyroxine and that's uh, T4 replacement. And there's a lot of different brands of levothyroxine. Some people are on the generic, which is fine. There are also brands such as Synthroid or Unithroid um, or Tyrosint. And some people like to be on the brand because um, you know you're getting the same type of medication every month. Some people might be sensitive to additives. Um, so, so some people are on the brand for that reason. Um, we also recommend that you take it first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. It's a very, it's a very fickle medication. If you take it too close to calcium pills or iron pills, it won't be absorbed as well. If you eat right away or eat first and then take your pill, it's not going to be absorbed as well. So um, I tell patients, keep it on your bedside table or next to your toothbrush. So as soon as you wake up, you take your pill. And by the time you're all dressed and ready, you can go downstairs and have your morning coffee or your breakfast. And, and hopefully you won't have to wait too long. Um, usually we don't supplement with T3. I do have some patients who are on it. Um, but your body is very good at converting the T4 to T3 in the tissues. So typically we stick with just the T4. Um, okay, next slide, please. 
So hyperthyroidism is much less common. It affects about 1% of the population. Um, typically, again, more common in females. Um, sometimes as we age, it can be more common, but I will say a lot of people in ch of childbearing age can be diagnosed with it. Um, if you have a personal or family history of thyroid disease, and then like I mentioned before, the amiodarone can definitely cause hyperthyroidism. Okay, next slide, please. So this is kind of the opposite end of the spectrum a little bit. There are some, some crossover with symptoms, but really it, it feels like you've had 17 cups of coffee. So you're, you can have a lot of nervousness. Patients will have a fine tremor. So I, I'll ask them to hold their hands out and they have a little bit of a shake. Um, they might be irritable. I have people with personality changes, even marital problems, because they're just very, very irritable. Um, and, and some people are crying in the office as soon as I walk in and I can tell that it's probably from their thyroid. Um, and it's very treatable and people feel better in the course of a few weeks. And it's, it's, it's nice to help these people because they do get better fairly quickly. Um, the bulging eyes that are mentioned on this slide, if you have a condition called Graves' disease, which, I, um, which I'll talk about in, in a few slides, it can affect the eyes and it can actually cause um, a protuberance of your eyes. And that you might see commercials for something for thyroid eye disease. It's very specific to Graves' disease um, and it's something that should be evaluated by an ophthalmologist. So I tell my patients with Graves' disease to make sure they're getting their eyes checked with an ophthalmologist. Um, patients with Graves' disease or um, hyperthyroidism can end up with a very big goiter. So sometimes they'll notice an enlargement of their neck, a swelling, even sometimes pain if the cause is a thyroiditis. And it can absolutely affect the periods. Um, it can cause diarrhea or frequent bowel movements. Um, it can cause palpitations or tachycardia, which means a fast heart rate. And it can some patients lose weight with it, but some patients also gain weight with it because your metabolism is higher, you're hungrier all the time, and, and some patients do gain weight. That's why this is not a weight loss drug, and um, we do not over-prescribe levothyroxine. We want that TSH to be in a nice normal range. We don't want there to be too much thyroid hormone because it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to lose weight. Um, it, it can cause hot flashes and increased sweating. Okay, next slide, please. So some underlying causes, and this is usually my job to figure out when I first meet patients with abnormal thyroid labs that are um, indicative of hyperthyroidism. So I'm trying to figure out why, because we treat them a little bit differently. So Graves' disease, I see a lot. Um, it, it's autoimmune condition. Um, and I also want to make sure that it's not because there's a nodule on the thyroid, which I'll show some pictures later, but sometimes nodules on the thyroid can be overactive and that nodule just makes way too much hormone. It doesn't listen to the signals of the body. Um, a thyroiditis is something that can happen where you get an inflammation of your thyroid. The thyroid can get very big and painful and um, it gets almost destroyed a little bit and, some, and the cells break open and thyroid hormone is released into your bloodstream and then you can have a period of hyperthyroidism. And then of course, very common to be on too much hormone. Um, or taking over-the-counter thyroid supplements that actually contain thyroid hormone, we definitely do not recommend doing that. So that can cause hyperthyroidism. Um, taking too much thyroid hormone, sometimes you're on a dose and you're doing great, and then you may have weight loss or something changes in your diet and you end up being on too much hormone, and then we have to make a dose adjustment. So that's why we do like to check in with our patients who are on levothyroxine treatment to make sure we don't end up overdosing or underdosing because bodies change over, over time and sometimes your dose has to be adjusted. Okay, next slide, please. So Graves' disease, um, it's very common. It's, it's one of the most common causes of hyperthyroidism um, and it affects females more often than males, especially the younger age range. And it's where antibodies are floating around in your blood. So in Hashimoto's, which is hypothyroidism usually, those antibodies kind of attack the thyroid and destroy it and it doesn't work as well. These thyroid, these antibodies actually activate your thyroid. So the body, th the thyroid thinks it's TSH, but it's not sensing how much hormone is around. So it's just activating the thyroid without any type of regulation. And your body just, your thyroid just turns out T4. Um, so you end up having unregulated production of thyroid hormone. Okay, next slide, please. 
um, in Graves' disease and some of the other uh, thyroid overactive conditions, the first line treatment and the first thing we're going to do is put you on a medication that blocks thyroid hormone production. And those are medications called PTU or methimazole. I use methimazole most of all. Uh, and they actually inhibit the production of thyroid hormone. We also will start a beta blocker most often because a lot of these patients, their heart is racing, they're tremulous, they're having a lot of activated symptoms um, and beta blockers can help with that. And we definitely wanna calm the heart down. We do not want your heart to be racing. Hyperthyroidism can cause something called atrial fibrillation. We wanna make sure the heart is protected. So we use beta blockers to do that until the thyroid levels are normal again. Um, we use the thyroid drugs usually for a maximum of one year. We try to get people off of thyroid drugs after a year. Um, and the reason is they do have some significant side effects. They can decrease your white blood cell count um, severely low, which can increase your risk of infection. It can also affect your liver. So we don't like having patients on this long-term. Now, I do have some patients who are on these drugs long-term because the permanent treatment of their hyperthyroidism is not a good option for them. And then we just watch it. I always check their thyroid, um, their thyroid levels. I keep an eye on their liver numbers. I keep an eye on their white blood cell count. I tell them to watch out for sore throat. That can be the first sign of a low white blood cell count problem um, and tell them to reach out to me if they have any of those issues. But let's say I have a patient with, who has Graves' disease. I usually start them on the medication. We give it some time. I adjust the dose over time. Usually we start out at a higher dose and then we go lower and lower and lower. And over time, over the course of a year, many patients get off the medication and go into remission, which is always great news. And sometimes they never have a problem with it again and it's done with. Um, but if, you, if we can't get you off of the medication in that amount of time, or if you have recurrence of the disease, that's when we talk about permanent treatment. And those two options are mainly radioactive iodine treatment, where um, you would go see a nuclear medicine doctor and they give you a one-time pill of radioactive iodine. That iodine gets taken up by the thyroid cells and then the cells no longer produce thyroid hormone after that. The other option is surgery to remove the thyroid. Um, both of those have risks and benefits and it would, it's, a, it's a personal decision with each patient. Um, but the outcome is, permanent hypothyroidism, meaning that the patient would have to take thyroid hormone replacement for the rest of their life. And that's very important to remember. So some people say, why am I trading, you know, methimazole for levothyroxine and going through this surgery or this radioactive iodine? And the reason is that levothyroxine doesn't really have side effects aside from not having the dose correct. So you want to make sure you have the right dose. Well, of course, some people have intolerances to certain brands and we always want to be careful of that and watch for that. But um, for the most part, it doesn't have the liver effects or the white blood cell effects that Methimazole has. Okay, next slide, please. So thyroid disease and pregnancy. Um, pregnancy can do strange things to the body. Um, usually we want to make sure there's a lot of thyroid hormone floating around for the baby. So we actually, for my patients who are pregnant and who are on levothyroxine, I try and keep their TSH goals a little bit lower. So I want a lot of hormone floating around. Um, so I have them check their labs like once a month um, or so just to keep an eye on things and make sure they're as, um, as optimal as possible. But thyroid, uh, so pregnancy can actually cause overactive thyroid problems. Um, and you can also have postpartum thyroiditis where you have hyperthyroidism post-pregnancy. So when I meet a patient with hyperthyroidism, that's one of the questions that I'll ask. Did you have a recent pregnancy? Because that can definitely cause a thyroiditis. Okay, next slide, please. So a goiter is an enlargement of the thyroid. Um, and again, this else, if it's just a diffuse enlargement of the thyroid, I see that a lot with Graves' disease. And the, the black outline is what, a, let's say, an example of what a normal sized thyroid would be. And then in this picture, the thyroid gland is enlarged. So a lot of times it is from Graves' disease. That's the most common or I'll see it a lot with Graves' disease. And then also you can have thyroid nodules that make up, um, that can enlarge the thyroid as well. Um, sometimes um, you can have a thyroiditis that can cause hyperthyroidism and it's really where the, the gland is inflamed. So sometimes the patients will have had a viral illness like COVID or the flu 
and the thyroid gland gets very large, very inflamed and damaged. So the thyroid hormone leaks out into the bloodstream and you become hyperthyroid for a period of period of time. It might only be for a few days. It might be for a few weeks. It might be for a few months. Generally, you end up, um, it ends up going away on its own. And we treat that sometimes with just um, NSAIDs like ibuprofen. Some people need steroids for it, but we need monitoring afterwards because you can actually have a decrease in hormone production as the gland recovers. Many people go back to normal though, fortunately, for thyroiditis. So the biggest things that I'm looking for for patients who are hyperthyroid, one is Graves' disease. I can figure that out by a blood test. I can test for that antibody in the blood. I, thyroid nodules can overproduce thyroid hormone or thyroiditis, and that can be postpartum or it can be from a viral illness. So those are the major causes of hyperthyroidism. Okay, next slide, please. So what is the thyroid nodule? Well, that is a discrete lesion within the thyroid gland that is, you can tell it's different from the surrounding thyroid. Um, and they're extremely common. People get very alarmed when a thyroid nodule is found for other reasons. But um, I tell people it's like moles on your skin. Most of us have it. And then you just need to get it checked out by the dermatologist once in a while, make sure it doesn't look too odd or um, growing too much. And then sometimes we do need to do a biopsy just to make sure everything is okay. But most of the time it is fine. Um, it's not something I would ignore, but it's also not something that I would want someone to lose sleep over while they're waiting for their biopsy. Um, it's more common in females as usual. Um, there's a lower prevalence of malignancy if you have multiple thyroid nodules. For some reason, your gland just likes to make a lot of nodules. And if you have one nodule, then that's a little bit higher risk. Um, but again, it's I, I think these numbers are a little higher than what I would what I would even say. I think the, the risk of malignancy is usually on the lower side. Okay, next slide. So what are the symptoms of a thyroid nodule? Usually absolutely none. Um, people usually find these because they had an MRI of their neck for neck pain or a carotid Doppler, and you can see um, the thyroid a little bit on that. And then they get sent to me, and then we do a thyroid ultrasound to evaluate. Very rarely you can have a fluid-filled cyst on the thyroid, and that will make... Um, a big bulge that can be painful. And then sometimes that comes on very quickly and then goes away very quickly, pretty uncommon. If they're very large, it can cause difficulty swallowing. It can cause some hoarseness or change in your voice. Um, and if they're, sometimes it can push on, remember it's wrapped around your trachea. So sometimes it can actually push the trachea to the side or your windpipe, push it to the side. You can feel shortness of breath when you're walking or especially when laying down, or you can have a choking sensation, difficulty with food passing through the esophagus, um, but those are usually with nodules that are on the larger side. Next slide, please. So when I meet a patient who has uh, thyroid nodules, I'm usually assessing in my head their risk level. Um, and I want to hear if there are any parts of their history that make them at an increased risk for thyroid cancer. And that would include head and neck radiation, whole body radiation, if they were close, like we mentioned before, to Chernobyl, um, a family history of thyroid cancer, we take that seriously, um, if they have a hereditary cancer syndrome, um, or if it was rapidly, rapidly growing, I want to evaluate that right away. If it's causing hoarseness, or you feel a lot of lymph nodes in the neck, um, or if it's large and just one nodule, those are some reasons why I would be more aggressive about biopsy. Next slide, please. So when I find a thyroid nodule, or if I'm sent a patient with a thyroid nodule, the first thing I'm going to do is check a TSH. A TSH level will um, tell me if the thyroid nodule is making too much hormone, or it can help me figure that out. If the TSH is normal, then that's what I would expect. Nine times out of 10, that's what I'm seeing. If the TSH is low, that means hyperthyroidism. That to me means that that nodule might be making thyroid hormone. Um, so the third point here, the thyroid uptake and scan would help me in that circumstance. A thyroid uptake and scan is a test where you get injected with a radioactive material, radioactive iodine. It doesn't destroy the thyroid. It's a little bit different than what we use for treatment for Graves' disease. Um, but what it does is your thyroid gland takes up this radiation and then it, it will be concentrated wherever the thyroid is making too much hormone. So if you have a nodule right here and it's making too much hormone, when they get the pictures 
of the uptake and scan, there'll be a lot, it'll be a very dark area right here so that we'll be able to say, okay, that nodule is making too much hormone. In Graves' disease, the whole gland will be very dark. So we'll know that it's the whole gland making it. So the uptake and scan can be helpful when I'm trying to diagnose hyperthyroidism or if I have a nodule and a low TSH. Um, other than that, we don't usually use an uptake and scan. That's the one time we use it. So for a nodule that has a normal TSH, for, for a patient that has a normal TSH, um, I'm going to be checking a thyroid ultrasound. Some people think MRI or CT are better, but not for the thyroid. The thyroid ultrasound is the best test for that. And I'm looking at the size of the nodules. I'm looking to see if they've grown since the last test. Um, and it helps me determine if we need to do a biopsy because we don't have to biopsy all nodules. If they're small or they look very unconcerning, I don't have to do a biopsy. I'll just watch it again in a year and so forth. Um, and if we do decide to move forward with a biopsy, it's a fine needle aspiration. It's kind of like a blood draw, but in the nodule in your neck, which is a weird place to have a needle poked. So I can't tell everybody that it's comfortable, but it usually only takes a few minutes. Um, I usually refer my patients to interventional radiology at Mather. They do an excellent job. I get great feedback from my patients for that. And it's quick in and out. You might have a little bit of bruising. I tell people not to go right before a big family dinner because people will be asking you about it. But other than that, it usually goes very, very well. Um, and then we get the results about a week later and we go over them. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so what we're looking for is thyroid cancer, which most of the time it's not. And I love getting those results. I call the patient, they're very happy that the levels are, that the results was normal. Um, I'm usually biopsying nodules that are one centimeter or larger. If they're over one centimeter, but they don't have suspicious features, we can even wait until 1.5 to two centimeters. And I'm usually the biopsying the large ones. I have patients with eight or 10 nodules in their thyroid gland. I'm not going to biopsy 10 nodules. So we pick the largest ones and then we watch. And then maybe next time in six months or a year, we'll biopsy some of the other ones if they look concerning. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so to diagnose thyroid cancer, we talked about the ultrasound, we talked about the biopsy. Sometimes we take a sample from the nodule and the pathologist looks at it under the microscope and they're not able to tell one way or another. They might see some, a cell that looks a little odd, but not enough to call it cancer, in which case they send it out for molecular testing. This is a development over the past 10, last 10 years, I would say, which is great because in the past we used to have to repeat the biopsy or people would have to go for surgery without really knowing if it was cancer, but the molecular testing helps us with that. Now, I still send, sometimes send people for thyroidectomy for a concerning result, and it ends up being non-cancerous, which is good news. And of course, we're, we're sad that we're sent for surgery without needing to, but in the end, it's better to be safe than sorry. Okay, it was, so we really don't know for sure until the thyroid comes out if it is truly cancer for the most part, sometimes we can tell. Next slide, please. Different types of thyroid cancer, I'll be brief about this. Papillary and follicular are by far the most common type, very treatable, um, spread very slowly. Um, even if they spread to the lymph nodes in the neck, still extremely treatable. Um, medullary and anaplastic thyroid cancer are quite uncommon. Um, those are the more aggressive types of cancers. Um, anaplastic, I have never seen in a decade of practicing. So, you know, it shows you how, um, how rare it is. And then medullary is also extremely uncommon. So for the most part, it's papillary, follicular, which fortunately are very treatable. Okay, next slide, please. So risk factors, we, we spoke about briefly, um, family history of thyroid cancer, exposure to radiation, for example, if you had cancer treatment as a child, um, and then increased age. Next slide. Treatment. Most of the time, surgery and you're done. Even if it's spread to the lymph nodes, even if it's a little bit on the larger side, sometimes we just take, do the surgery and then you're absolutely done. And then I monitor. Um, if it looks like it's a little bit higher risk, for example, the, the tumor is on the larger side or it extended outside of the thyroid or there's a lot of lymph node involvement, um, we might do a radioactive iodine pill. Uh, remember the radioactive iodine, it gets taken up by any thyroid cells that might be anywhere. So if the cancer spread up to lymph nodes in the neck that weren't removed during surgery, or if there's microscopic little cells left, the radioactive iodine will be absorbed by those cells and they will be destroyed. Um, 
So it's a nice targeted treatment of any remaining cancer cells. And then monitoring after surgery, there are whole body scans that we can do. There's uh, something called a thyroglobulin level. That is a cancer tumor marker level after surgery. So it's not helpful for people who have a thyroid. So don't get alarmed if someone checked a thyroglobulin level on you and it was high. If you have a thyroid, that's normal. Um, but if you don't have a thyroid and we're worried about cancer, we watch that level because if it starts to rise, it could mean that there's a recurrence. So it's a nice way for us to be alerted that we need to look into this a little bit more carefully. And then we do periodic neck ultrasounds just to see if anything pops up, which hopefully it, nothing does. Um, at, uncommonly, people need chemotherapy or exter external beam radiation, but again, that's very uncommon. Next slide, please. So this is a nice picture of a thyroid nodule. Um, it might look like a lot of fuzzy gray areas, but um, that big circle in the center that's very dark is actually your windpipe. Um, and the thyroid is that butterfly-shaped gland around it. And, and um, on the left side of the picture, which is actually the right side of the thyroid, because this is a cross-section through the patient's neck. So it's basically a, a cut like this. The patient's legs are coming out towards us. So the, the part that's larger, the big circle on the right side is actually the right side of the thyroid, although it's the left side of our screen. So you can see there's a big circle there, whereas the other side is teeny tiny, that's a nice thyroid nodule. Um, and other cuts through the ultrasound, you can actually see that it's separated from the rest of the thyroid. Um, so that would be a nodule that's a little bit on the larger side that I would biopsy. Um, and that's what I look at a lot of the time is just the thyroid ultrasound and we determine about the biopsies. Um, okay, so let's see if we have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Kalina, for your extremely informative presentation. If you wouldn't mind sharing your office phone number if anybody wanted to make an appointment with you. Sure, our office number is 631-978-7500. If anyone has any questions, you may enter them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. All questions are anonymous to protect your privacy. Okay, so here's a question. Are goiters caused by hyperthyroidism? Um, so it can be is one answer. Goiters, the term goiter just means an enlargement of the thyroid and the a goiter can be caused by a condition that causes hyperthyroidism. So for example, Graves' disease. I, I walk into the room and there's a big gland on the patient. I can almost tell just walking in the room that they have Graves' disease. Sometimes it's thyroid no nodules causing the goiter that they just look very enlarged. Um, so that's a good question. We don't always know just by looking at the patient or seeing a goiter. Sometimes a patient just has a big thyroid and we don't know why. Um, as long as the hormone production is okay and as long as it's not nodules, um, then there's nothing to do about it but monitor. Okay, so do people with Hashimoto's ever improve or are they on medications for a lifetime? That is a great question. For the most part with Hashimoto's, once you hit the point where you need thyroid hormone production, I would say you usually end up on the medication permanently. There, I do have some patients that are in a gray zone where their TSH is a little bit abnormal, but their T4 is still normal. Sometimes we'll try a little bit of hormone and if they don't feel any better from it, they don't feel like they're getting any benefit from it, we might stop it and see if their levels maintain, a, 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 don't get too out, um, out of the normal range. Um, but for the most part, once you start medication, it usually means you need it. The one time that I would say people can get off thyroid hormone replacement is in a thyroiditis. So with a thyroiditis, it can initially, so after a viral illness or pregnancy, initially it gets very inflamed, very large. Um, there's destruction of the tissue. The thyroid hormone leaks out into the bloodstream. And then the thyroid is kind of destroyed a little bit. So you actually end up hypothyroid for a period of time. And in that case, sometimes we treat with thyroid hormone replacement. And sometimes the patients rec recover their own thyroid hormone production. So that's one time where I do see patients get off of thyroid hormone. Um, let's see. So 
Uh, there's a great question here about radio frequency ablation of benign nodules. Um, so this is an up and coming treatment of benign thyroid nodules where they're actually doing a targeted ablation. So in the past, we have been um, limited to surgical removal of thyroid nodules as the main way of removing them. So I have patients that have these big nodules that are really causing symptoms, but it's not cancer. We've biopsied it. And it's really not, it's, it's not something that they absolutely have to have removed for a reason for cancer. So in the past, surgery has been our only option. Um, but there's a new up and coming treatment called radial frequency ablation, where they can actually um, target the nodule without doing surgery, and it can shrink over time. It's not done here locally, but stay tuned. That's probably going to be expanded and as more and more centers start doing it. Um, I'll just repeat the phone number in case anybody missed it. It's 631-978-7590. And we have two offices. We have one that's um, across the street from Mather Hospital. It's 125 Oakland Avenue and we're suite 203. And that's right by the train station um, in Port Jefferson. And then we also um, have, a, have a, an office in Stony Brook behind the Burger King. There's a medical complex there and that's 2500 Nesconset Highway. And we're building 16. Okay, so let's see what else. So when taking a blood test, what is the normal range for T4? That's a great question. Um, so every lab has its own normal range. So it, the best and um, the most vague answer that I can give basically is looking at the results on your specific lab test. Generally a level around one is normal. Maybe if I could say off the top of my head, like 0.8 to 1.7 might be normal. And outside of that range, it's abnormal, but every lab has its own specific um, normal range. So you should definitely go by whatever the lab says is normal. Um, so is there any natural way to shrink nodules and lower thyroid hormone? That, that is a great question. And I wish I could say yes. I wish I could say go gluten-free and you will get rid of your nodules. But unfortunately, we don't have good options right now for a natural way of treating it. Um, you know, you can find online lots of people making recommendations. And I tell people, as long as it's not harmful to you, it's okay to try it. If you want to try to go gluten-free, see if you feel better. If your hormone levels regulate, that's fine. Um, but as of right now, there's not enough evidence for me to say to do that. So I don't recommend that because of that reason. Um, so unfortunately, shrinking the nodules as of right now, it's really just surgery. Radioactive iodine maybe can shrink a little bit, but mostly surgery. And then the radio frequency ablation is something that in the future will probably become more popular. Um, and adjusting your thyroid hormone levels um, naturally. The only thing I would say is just be careful of thyroid supplements. They sometimes contain actual ground up hormone from animals and um, can actually cause hyperthyroidism. So I definitely don't recommend that. Um, and also if, um, there's selenium is something that can help with Graves disease. So selenium is okay to try to take. Um, but other than that, you know, we don't, we don't have a lot of natural things. We, I wish I could say not to eat fish and then it'll get better, but we don't really have a lot of evidence for anything like that. Um, I don't have any evidence to say soy milk can cause a problem, um, or any other, you know, I would say you have to maybe be careful with very iodine rich seaweeds, like a, like people who take kelp supplements, you just be careful with that, especially if you have underlying um, thyroid conditions. I will say if you have Graves disease, especially if you're not being treated and you're not on antithyroid hormone, be very careful with CAT scan contrast because I have a lot of patients that are doing okay with their Graves disease, they get CAT, CAT scan contrast and their levels become very abnormal. So I would alert your endocrinologist before you get any type of CAT scan contrast if you have a thyroid condition. Um, let's see, are there side effects of taking levothyroxine forever? And is it common to increase the medication over time? Great question. Um, so levothyroxine doesn't have a lot of side effects and definitely not long-term. Sometimes people can have little intolerances, like they find they feel better on tyrosins, but not Synthroid or so forth, and and playing around with the types and the brands is okay. But in terms of long term damage, like if you're on it for ten years, you'll get heart disease or cancer or anything like that. Not at all. 
very, very safe. It doesn't have the liver problems or the white blood cell problems that you have with methimazole or some other medications. Um, so it's actually very safe to be on lifelong. Do you possibly have to take more medication over time? Some people do. So remember, if you have Hashimoto's, your thyroid is being attacked. And at first you might only need 25 micrograms because that thyroid is really trying hard and making more hormone. But then over time, it just can't keep up. And then you end up on 50 and 75 and 88. And then we're just going up and up and up. Sometimes with weight changes. So if someone gains a lot of weight, we might have to increase the dose. If someone loses a lot of weight, we might have to decrease the dose. Menopause, pregnancy, so many things can play a role in how much thyroid hormone you, replacement you need. So I recommend you know, getting the levels checked every few months to make sure nothing is out of whack, especially if you're not feeling well. Let's see, what treatment do you suggest for subclinical hyperthyroidism with a small toxic nodule? That's a great question. So it, it definitely is patient dependent and I would um, you know, recommend who, if someone has that condition to talk to their endocrinologist, but um, there are guidelines for when to treat hyperthyroidism. If you're young and the, the TSH is just barely abnormal and your T4 and T3 are normal, um, then we might just watch. But you know, many times we, if, if the levels are really getting abnormal, I would recommend removal of the nodule, either surgery or radioactive iodine. Um, let's see. So um, there are, so bleeding with an FNA is, is a very good question. Um, so many times if someone has a heart attack or if they have atrial fibrillation or they've had stents placed, they might be on a blood thinner and that might be an antiplatelet medication or something like Coumadin. Um, and those medications increase your risk of bleeding. I will say that Thyroid nodule biopsies, fortunately, are very low risk for bleeding. Um, whoever is doing the biopsy, however, should be made aware ahead of time that someone is on an anticoagulant or a medication that is a blood thinner, because that person might want to discuss with your cardiologist or with um, whoever is prescribing your blood thinner as to whether it can be held or if they're comfortable doing the biopsy without the blood thin, um, while you're on the blood thinner. So I think that's something that the person who, whoever's doing the biopsy, whether it's radiology, whether it's your endocrinologist, um, whether it's interventional radiology, they should be made aware ahead of time if someone is on a blood thinner, um, cause it's usually a case by case basis. Um, I used to do um, biopsies in the office. We've been on hold with that, but um, I've done them on, on um, anticoagulation before, and then sometimes I would hold it. So it just is very patient dependent. Um, so the, the, uh, there's one question for the benefits of radiofrequency ablation. So I would say one benefit is you don't have to go through surgery. So that's a big benefit. Um, and I think that's where the majority of um, the appeal is, which I think is a great because if it's benign, you don't wanna go through the surgery, um, it, it would be a fantastic option. Surgery in itself, um, I usually send to very experienced surgeons, people who do this all the time, um, and they make a, an incision in the neck. My patients come back with this tiny little incision and it usually heals really, really well. Um, risks of surgery, remember we talked about those parathyroid glands that live behind the thyroid. If you're taking out the whole thyroid, the surgeon just has to be careful about those parathyroid glands. So you wanna leave those in if possible. So um, many times the patients will be on high doses of calcium right after surgery to, pre to prevent that calcium level from dropping too low because those parathyroid glands will be touched in surgery. They'll be manipulated by the surgeon. Um, so even if they weren't removed completely, a lot of times they just go to sleep for a little while because they're, they're a little bit shocked from the surgery itself. And so they'll need, um, the patients usually need calcium for a few days um, the hope is that the parathyroids are still there and then they can come off of the calcium. Another risk of surgery is it can affect the nerves in the neck and can cause some hoarseness, uh, but most patients do really well with surgery. Um, radioactive iodine, that's another treatment for hyperthyroidism. Um, it can cause some inflammation of the salivary glands. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of risks and benefits to everything, so that's definitely a personal decision. Um, but in terms of the hypothyroidism, the treatment with levothyroxine, people do very well with. It's just finding the right dose and then finding sometimes the right brand. And remembering to take it first thing in the morning on an empty stomach, that's the most difficult, I would say. I know I would have a problem remembering that. 
Does anybody have any other questions? I saw a question asking the name of your practice. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, our practice is Harborview Endocrinology um, and we're part of Mather Hospital. Let's see. Um, is there a cancer concern when an ultrasound of a thyroid nodule results is described as vascular is a great question someone has. So we have all these charts and um, we look at what's uh, an increased risk uh, versus a decreased risk. Sometimes vascularity can play a role, yes. Um, if it's listed as vascular, you know, it could be something that's concerning for cancer. It might also not be. I'm not gonna, that usually doesn't make or break my decision to biopsy. Um, but yes, I would say if, some, if there's a vascular nodule, as long as it meets the size criteria for biopsy, I would want to biopsy it. But I wouldn't, again, most of the time I biopsy these and they're not, and they're benign, but I wouldn't ignore it. I would absolutely go for the biopsy if it meets criteria otherwise. Well, thank you, Dr. Kalina, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. If you have any additional questions, please email them to matherhospital at northwell.edu, and I'll be sure to pass those on to Dr. Kalina and get those answered. Once you exit the webinar, you'll see a link to complete a brief survey. If you could please complete the survey, your feedback is extremely important to us and helps us plan our future programs. Thank you all for joining today's webinar. If you'd like to view other Healthy You webinars we've presented, you can find them at matherhospital.org slash healthy you. Thank you. Um, oh, I do see one more, in case anyone- Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry, there's one more question that I think I missed. Um, if, if we do have a biopsy of a nodule, what do we do after that? Do we say everything is fine and never look at it again? Um, no, the answer is that we usually still monitor First, maybe once a year or maybe after six months if there's a number, a few nodules. Um, but if you have a benign nodule, I'll check again after a year. If it hasn't grown or changed, maybe another year or maybe two years and then just keep an eye on it. And then it's really on a case by case basis how often that, that we evaluate. Um, but I would say it should just continue to be my, um, monitored. Okay. All right, thank you so much. Any other questions pop in? I don't think I see anything, just um, if, if there will be a recording. Yes, there will be. And it'll be on matherhospital.org slash healthy you. Okay. You're very welcome. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.